All right, welcome to My Swing Evolution. Today is our inaugural Skype interview with uh, a wonderful gentleman I've been friends with for a couple of years now uh, yeah. named Billy Martin. Uh, yeah. Billy's been helping me with my golf swing. He's written a number of books on Mr. Hogan, and he's uh, a really, really intelligent person when it comes to the golf swing. And he's been uh, gracious enough to actually help me along the way. And right now, I'm really digging into his work. So, Billy, why don't you tell us yeah. a little bit about yourself? Yeah. You know, uh, in, in 19, uh, uh, this would be actually in, in 2007, I was doing some other uh, Ben Hogan uh, video uh, projects. And uh, I, I found a handwritten letter. And this intrigued me. My, uh, I wanted to find the truth about what Mr. Hogan did. I, uh, you know, starting with me in, in my golf career, uh, I'm 65 years old, and uh, as most junior golfers uh, back in, gosh, this would be in the, in the 60s, early 60s. I, I read, you know, Mr. Hogan's Five Modern Fundamentals, and uh, I did look at at the power of golf. But I, uh, I, I cared for Mr. Hogan in many different ways. Um, he's quite a bit like my dad, uh, Woody, who just passed away. That uh, Mr. Hogan led a very tough, regimented, disciplined life. And uh, so I, I studied his golf swing. And uh, as we know, there's you know, so much information about him out there. And uh, so I, I taught golf in the 80s in Sacramento. I, I was an assistant golf pro. It was kind of like Bill Murray, the type of thing that I, I, I worked the night driving range and we had things going on and I taught a little bit of golf there and it was all from uh, the five modern fundamentals. I, I was successful as, as a junior golfer and when I won, I, I won going away. So um, I, I just love his, uh, his passion, how he, uh, the story was that he'd go out and help folks and if they didn't listen, people would turn around and he'd, he'd be taking off. He had patience. A lot of people say that he wasn't a balanced person. He had, he had to have patience because he hit a trillion golf balls. And uh, so I, I uh, had the passion for, for Mr. Hogan and, you know, what he did with his life. And uh, he, uh, I, I think, forever in a day will be uh, a, a individual, a complete individual that uh, golfers and athletes will, will look up to. And um, a little bit, you know, coming in, into the, more, you know, the more, more current, this handwritten letter, this mystical letter that I have this project going on, uh, I hit uh, 60,000 golf balls in 2011. I, I drug my V1 software and the handwritten letter and I dissected what in the world was going on in, in Mr. Hogan's mind in 1948. Uh, after finding the, uh, the student, Pat Mahoney, I spent six months researching because uh, I knew that I was on the right track. Uh, and I had a list of over a hundred Mahoney's in the California area. The last call in my basement here, I uh, placed the call and it, it, it was his grandson. Mr. Mahoney passed away and the handwritten letter was written in 1948 to uh, PJ Pro Pat Mahoney. And so I, I knew I was on the right track. Uh, the grandson says, you got the right Mahoney, but uh, you need to talk to my dad who's a judge. Judge Mahoney says that all the information about this handwritten letter is, is at Pasio Tempo uh, Country Club and that I, uh, I could have all of the documents. Uh, uh, What's, what's crazy is the Hogan heirs, uh, he didn't have any uh, uh, kids, Mr. Hogan. And uh, the niece gave all the information when uh, you know, Mr. Hogan passed away and, uh, and, and, and Valerie to uh, James Dodson. James Dodson, who wrote uh, The American Life, Ben Hogan. It was all documented. So what I'm doing is I'm giving the information out. I've, I've done my homework. I see individuals like you are Hogan-esque. Crystal, you are a very courageous man to make your swing changes. You're dedicated, you practice all your martial arts and your, your uh, dance background. So I was so enamored. I don't feel like I'm your coach. I feel like maybe 
uh, I could advise and give tips and information out. I want to uh, give the information out. I want people to enjoy Mr. Hogan for uh, the time and effort that he put in, certainly with Mr. Mahoney. So I, on, on that note, I think it's important that uh, I've been very open source as well with my information. Right. If I learn something, I put it out there. Um, I have also uh, written my first book, but right. that's when you have over 200 videos and somebody discovers your work, it's going to be very difficult for them to make heads or tails going through the library and randomly finding videos. Exactly. So that's why that book serves as a compendium of all the information in one place. But every day, you know, we keep discovering new things, or at least wow. I do. You know, so uh, I think uh, I think that it's great that we're having an open source revolution in the exactly. world of golf. Yeah, just uh, just a couple of videos that I, I did for you. Uh, I can see the you know tremendous amount of, of uh, desire and wanting to have somebody like yourself or maybe somebody like me that has information. They want to sit with the technology now. We know what Mr. Hogan uh, was doing uh, in 1953. I have access to the Fernando Cano's Mexico City home video. I contacted uh, Pepe uh, Cano. And uh, so we're seeing uh, 1948, uh, or, or excuse me, 1953, when he won his Triple Crown. But getting back to you and your uh, audience, you have a tremendous um, uh, grasp of, of the golf swing, and you're, you're willing to put yourself out there. Uh, I mentioned to you, I think, in our last uh, little chat, that uh, golfers have an ego. Golf is a very, uh, my dad used to say, a very jealous sport. Not in a bad way, because it's so personal and it's so competitive. But you're an open door. You, uh, what I've seen, you, you've gone uh, maybe around the world to uh, folks that you know that care for Mr. Hogan, that had his his dynamic you know, golf swing in their heart and their mind. and that would, would pass the information off. So uh, kudos to, uh, to you, you know, Crystal, for the time that you're spending. I, I bet every day or in your waking hours, maybe when you're sleeping, you're thinking about a golf swing and how you can uh, practice this up. I, ha I have a couple questions for you since we never really had a one-on-one. A -on -one. Now, you're in the filming uh, industry, is that correct? You're uh, involved with... Uh, with uh, Maybe Hollywood, the artsy fartsy. <laughs> yeah, I make my living as a television producer and director. Yeah. Well, that's very good. So you have a have a visual uh, uh, sense about you, and that you see things, and you uh, with your martial arts. I'm quite sure uh, I, it looked like you liked. Uh, you really were uh, in, enthralled with uh, with uh, help me out and Bruce having Lee. Bruce Lee, I'm having a senior moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm extremely visual. Um, I yeah. grew up drawing and painting a lot. I can look at something and mimic it. Uh, I started studying ballet at the age of 21, and within two years I was a professional. Yeah. And that was by mimicking Mikhail Baryshnikov and being right. able to look at it. And, and I'll tell you, um, you know, both of those gentlemen are extremely complex. I can't think of many things that are much more complex than that. But Mr. Hogan has served to be the, the, the final piece of the puzzle. I mean, he is what he's doing is so intricate. When you, I mean, when you get down to the very fine details, yeah. it's amazing what he's doing. And, uh, and it's served a, a, as a lot of fun for me in my 40s. Uh, I can't really oh pursue those other things to the degree that, that I can pursue this. And it's the perfect fit for me. But you have all that still with you. Your uh, ability to uh, to look at things to to command your body uh, at at runtime. I come from a, a computer programming uh, background. This is how I made my money. I'm retired. I worked for Arnold Schwarzenegger in California. I was a programmer. Arnold. Everybody can do the Arnold. Hope you got room for my fist. Kind of put you in your stomach. You know. But anyhow, you know. Uh, I think you have a snowflake mind, a creative mind. Plus, you have a structured mind. When you program, you because uh, you can do anything with a computer anymore, and you want to have a creative. You want to be in the state of the art thing because things get uh, you know out of uh, vogue.
but you need a, a structured mind too. And Mr. Hogan, as we see, I believe he had both. He uh, he knew he had to get in his hands in this position because he had to hit it off that hard pin, and he hated the hook. So he had to create, as you said uh, in your books and in, in, in when you talk about it, that you you understood Mr. Hogan ha had to go through adversity. He had the monkey on his back. He saw his, his father, uh, you know, commit suicide as the, as the story goes. So he um, he, as, as Jackie Burke says, that um, uh, you know, gaming and and getting over on people. The caddies back there had to fight. You had to fight so you'd be in line to get the bag. And he went through all that. And he watched some of the uh, of the good golfers. He caddied for good golfers. But um, no, I'm I'm so grateful that that you call me my, uh, a friend. And that is so uh, crazy about the technology that I can be in a basement. And this is where I live right now. I'm I'm running in Missouri, and uh, so uh, I'm so happy that I, I've I've met you, and that you are uh, a open vessel. I think that's what you are. That you you'll put yourself out there. You'll put on your best performance, your your best uh, structured mind, your best snowflake uh, attitude. And you're putting it out there for uh, for everybody, and that's just really good for you, uh, you know, Crystal. Well, let me ask you a question. I think that uh, the one thing that we share that brought us together is is an intense fascination with Hogan as the man and what he did technically. Could you sum up for me um, how you see his swing in total? Because the thing that I'm I'm understanding is. Um, I have been taught by some of the most famous teachers in the world, and uh, what I feel I'm doing in relation to the Hogan swing, I think is very different from what these major modern teachers have been teaching. Like, I think that it's the pivot itself is right. completely different. Oh, exactly. And that gets back to, uh, you know, like Jackie Burke, it was the caddy move, it, it was the caddy motion. It's the pivot. It's it's the hips and shoulders. Mr. Hogan says in the handwritten letter that the hips control the shoulders. Of course, he mentioned in his five modern fundamentals that you want to restrict the hips. You can build power by restricting the bottom and torquing up and going on the outside circle and then really generating a lot of a lot of power. So you can build the uh, tension from the lower half, restrict the pivot, and come in. Or you can let everything flow back. This is one of the first videos I saw about you. That you, you know, Martin Ayers is just a wonderful guy. I wish I could sit and have a foster beer with him. But he understood how everything flows back. Whatever you move back, then you can gather up. It's like if you have a, a kickboard in a in a pool, and you're pushing that water back, and then you you collect that that volume of water. You push and push. So it's, it's the lower body, gets the club in motion up at the top. I call it the inside figure eight shaped golf swing. And this is what, a little bit what you're transitioning into. We don't want to get too, too technical with, with your folks, but that's what I think is, is your breakthrough that you're, you're sensing. You're an athletic man and you got a, a good cognitive ability how your body's moving at speed. And you're, you're transforming the lower body into the upper body, and everything's coming in into the ball. And that's what Mr. Hogan, that's what we see in Mr. Hogan's golf swing. Um, it's the pivot, which is your body, and then the arm swing that controls the, uh, the golf instrument, and then your hands and wrists. There's three things. Mr. Hogan is known for his, this pivot. What was he doing with his lower body? And, and then what did he do with his arms and his hands? And then finally, you know, getting the club head into the ball. I call it three things. You're learning and how uh, to uh, sense where the body's going, and how that relates to the upper half. And then the last thing is getting that that club head into the ball. That's basically it. I, I stress like what you're saying is you have to have a pivot. You have to understand. And there's things how you get set up. So let, may I uh, jump in for a second? Sure. When um, when I was in my mid-teens, uh, I got to take some lessons with David Ledbetter. And 
And Mr. Ledbetter, uh, I appreciate it very much because I saw many great golfers and I learned what it takes to get this game mastered. I mean, I'd see Nick Faldo out there. Oh. I would see a lot yeah. of great golfers. So it was a wonderful time. Uh, but, you know, and this is not to knock. It's just to discuss. No. He probably yeah. looks at the, the instruction differently exactly than he did at the time. But what I was taught at the time, um, of course, I was a very flexible teenager, was to keep my hips in place and turn my upper body against my hips. Now, right. I know that Mr. Hogan had talked about restricting the hip pivot, but I think that he was referring in like he let it go completely or a lot of guys of the day did. And he was very flexible and he probably I think it was taken too far. I believe so. I believe that's correct, because you see all of the classic swingers. Snead didn't didn't restrict his hips. All of the uh, people pound to pound could, could play uh, longer than a cup of coffee. As Jimmy Ballard would say, is and they were not going to beat their body up. You're, you're sensing it. The only thing you know contacting the ground is your feet. The only thing that you have holding the, the golf club is your hands. And they just didn't come up in in a robotic. Now that's not to say, and I, I'm quite sure that you agree that you you can hit the golf ball, get very up close to the ball. You see Rory, you know McElroy, extreme. He even sense he looks like he's even getting close to the ball. And get this thing out, and then dropping it down, and then he, his hips even look like they're going backwards. Mm -hmm. You can generate a tremendous amount of power, but you don't want to be in an army left and right and right and left. You want well, to hit I, it. I, I think with Rory, we could agree that he is utilizing his hips and ground forces. Yeah, but I think that what happened was when Hogan said, you know, when he was talking about. Uh, restricting them, he was saying to not let them run willy nilly, and then people right. read that and thought, yes. well, "Let's just keep them locked in concrete." Right. And that's that's where I found myself for twenty years playing terrible golf. Yeah, because um, here again, this is how I think about it. Because how I write about it, you can go on outside circle, the upper body taking the club head right from the beginning. You can you you can pump out with the last three fingers. Now you're on the outer circle. And now your upper body is controlling where the orbit of, of, of the golf club. And then you have to you have to maintain and manage what's coming in, in through. David Ledbetter is very interesting. <clears throat> On his an invisible club head drill, is he, he told Nick Faldo is, is to have the left hand over the right hand. So the very first move is you're going to shoot the club head out. I call it the Hogan's meatloaf drill. Mr. Hogan liked to stake a certain way. Hogan's meatloaf is is the right over, is the right hand over the left, and this get, keeps the left hand on the inner circle. That little cup that he has at address, you take it to the inside, and then there's a little bit of a transitionary move. It's, I call it the uh, elusive butterfly of love motion because it is the shape of a figure eight. And once you get there, then the, everything's laying back. This is what Tiger is learning with. Uh, is it Kumo? Kumo. His, Come up is that as you take it back, Mr. Hogan would would uh, put his hand here and see the the plain lines. It's a laying back of that shaft now. People are seeing that. And once that the just the club lays back, then you can use your pivot to bring it in. You don't have to use your left forearm to manufacture all this Ex motion. Exactly. Going. Now, now that's the thing that I think is so fascinating that I'm starting to get a handle on. I, we haven't discussed this head to head, but I'm going to ask you: Would sure. you say that Sam Snead and George Newton have a similar move? They have this inside figure eight shape swing. Now, with Mr. Snead, he aimed to the right, and he was a puller of the golf ball. Now, I, I helped write a book, uh, I'll do a little promo for uh, Ed Seal, Ron Sadoff, and Randy Joyner. Ron Sadoff uh, played golf with Mr. Hogan. Uh, he was assistant uh, pro, uh, Jimmy Demerit at Champions. He played golf with Mr. Hogan, and he told Ron Sadoff, Mr. Hogan told Ron Sadoff, that if Sam could line up, he could beat everybody. Sneed used to get a hickory stick and put a road apple at the end of it. He felt the end of the club, Mr. Sneed. And then he'd aim to the right, he'd have this uh, da 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 da, he had a waltz rhythm in his mind. He, he walked into the orchestra. 
as Elkington told you. You want to sense it from the back. You want to walk in. But he had this graceful inside out, and then he would a long follow through, get that shoulders coming through. That's a wonderful concept. And this is, is, is a pivot-driven golf swing, Mr. Steeds. The thing that I, I, that I kind of notice, um, there's a little difference between the way Hogan uh, lays it off in the transition and the way Knudsen and, and, and exactly. Steed do it. And it's, it's very subtle, but they're exactly. so deep that still they're, they're, I find their swings to be similar. Exactly. Now with, with uh, Knudsen, he would do a hitchhiking move and he would come up. His idea was uh, like a flagpole when he was going to school out in the Catholic uh, uh, practice area, church. It had a steeple way out in the distance. He wanted his left arm and club shaft to come right up in, in mirror image of flagpole. His left arm would come up like this and then he would track in where Hogan would get it in a pivot and he would just rip it and he would just come through with the Hogan finish, the, the coat uh, or the doorway frame. Here again, Knudsen would have the same setup. He loved Mr. Hogan, shared cigarettes with Mr. Hogan. Mr. Hogan says, if your golf swing is like that cigarette that I just uh, got from you. But uh, anyhow, uh, Knudsen came through with a different motion of his left arm, came in, and then he would retract back in. He was huge on uh, George Newton with the clapping of the hands, with the grip, ever old neutral, both thumbs on the top. I don't know if you can see it here, but that was a little bit of different setup. Mr. Hogan had to put his hands on a club, a little bit different. But uh, we're all uh, looking at small nuances. If you're very athletic, more like a Hogan, do the Hogan. If, if you're more uh, uh, thinner and, does, and, and not have that flash speed, Coming through, you can do this hitchhiking motion and then uh, look at uh, George, George Newton. Let me ask you this. It uh, brings up a great question. Um, in regards to the grip, it, you know, I look at all these gentlemen, uh, Jack Nicholas, Hogan, they both said their gri grips got weaker as they got older or wiser even. Yeah. And uh, I think that it's uh, a very common trend on tour to see guys or young guys today going back to the super strong grip, but back right. in the day, they they tell a young pro, you're not well, going to win a tournament like that. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's the technology, and here again, if you get a little bit stronger, you're going to go on the outside, and then you're going to drop it down a little bit. Now, uh, <clears throat> up at the top of the swing anymore with, with the young guns, the stronger grip that you're noticing, it's a one-two tempo. It's one, and then at the top, they might even have the club face a little bit closed at the top, and they're absolutely hitting the ball. They get up there, a little bit wider stance, getting their, their angles, and they're up at the top, and then bang, that ball's gone. And if you, uh, there's different ways to hit the golf ball, but with older day, it's more like a, 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 three, a three beat, da 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 then there was a motion here, a set, and then, then, uh, then coming on through, instead of a one, two. Could you play now in regards to the way they're hitting the ball today? I think that obviously they hit it very hard and very far, and they're shooting very good scores. I believe that if they were playing with the old spinnier ball, they oh, may yeah. not be able to play with that, play like that. Yeah, I, I believe so. Well, the equipment, uh, the weighting in the club and the ball, you know, everything's changing. Uh, it's changing right now as we speak. Um, Getting back, I think uh, we were uh, discussing the Hogan Golf Equipment. We don't want to let that go. Uh, Terry Kohler is the new CEO of the new Ben Hogan Equipment. I had an opportunity to speak with Terry. What a nice man. He called me back. And three without, days. Three days. What did he tell you? Is, it, is that what it is? Three January days? January 20th. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think they're coming out with the irons first. And then uh, his goal is to get all the equipment out there, um, and that is great. And, um, so anything we're doing, uh, Hogan-related for these young people, uh, people need to know real quickly, to me, the Hogan name, H for honesty, O for overcoming obstacles, G for being a gentlewoman or a gentleman, A is a attentive to how you look, like what you're looking right now, in for in the dirt or integrity. 
I'm going to do another book, and I might, I might bug you for somebody like you to use your wonderful golf swing. We can weave a storyline. We want to do what we can do to pass this information off to the younger people. Uh, they think Hulk Hogan. You know, Mr. Hogan doesn't need us, but I think since we are getting so much out of what he did, that somebody should just put it out there. And that's what you do, uh, you know, Christo. You're out there with your wonderful uh, film background. When you do stuff, you're doing it to what you feel is your best. And that's what M Mr. Hogan, to me, stood for. At, you know, the, the dimples on the golf ball, he'd sit. And he'd go through all his golf balls. Uh, you know, Jimmy DeMarit would say, what the hell are you doing, Ben? He had a bucket of golf balls. He'd be looking at the golf balls. He says the paint wasn't wasn't right. Back then he'd throw the ball away. Attentive to detail. You're going to be known to who you are. We only have a certain amount of lifespan. I'm 65. My life is gone. I remember when I was your age. 30 years have gone quick. My dad passed away at 93. If I have 30 more years on this earth and every day I can get up and maybe spend an hour on a golf course, I'm happy. So, Great. Great. So um, my goal today is uh, I'm going to be working on this left arm and letting it release yep. as opposed to I was doing that hold off. Right. I, I think that was really being a, a tremendous hindrance. It was it was uh, it was stalling my pivot. And so I'm going to be working on getting that that left yeah. hand released. Is that does that sound oh, good? You know, the little thing that we were talking about, and I'll just demonstrate it is that uh, for the folks the folks out in the TV world or, or the uh, computer world, you can sense a, a put in your, uh, your right hand underneath your elbow. You want to feel when you come in that you just don't want to carry these angles forward. Now, that's not to say that you, that you couldn't play off that way. You can get, get this thing maybe very square or even close at the top and uh, s swinging low left. Mr. Hogan was, was known to, uh, to say that you have to be level left. He wanted everything level left, but then up. We never saw Mr. Hogan way over here, the, the golf equipment and whatever, unless he was hitting around a tree and had to, had to fake it. But it's uh, inside figure eight shaped golf swing, a feeling coming over the top. You're right in front of the ball, and then you release your, your wrists. The wrists have to come up, and then you're into your finish. People get confused about follow through and finish. They're two separate things. You don't want to quit on the shot. You want everything to be a follow through. The wrist will come straight up, more of a vertical where, where everything's in line here, and then there's a movement. And then uh, the Newton, of course, is that you want to evaluate what you did. You want to uh, look and see what's going on, and then you make your adjustment. So, but that that's cool. That's the only thing I've seen your golf swing. The only thing I've ever seen your golf swing is your arm movements. You have beautiful arm. You always had great arm motion. I was just picky any about the little small things. And that just that is fine tuning. I don't know if Mr. Hogan really in a sense knew all the things he was doing. He knew mo he probably knew most of it. We have the technology now to know in his brain what he was thinking and watch him. That I'm, I have a project now. It's it's the uh, Fernando Cano films in 3D. I have it in 3D like, and you've seen most of the films that I uh, that I've. Uh, but with that nine iron, I have it in blue. Or a pitching wedge. You see depth. You can put your arms around him. You can sense what he's doing in uh, time and space, and that's what Mr. Hogan did. He got everything back behind him. He got everything set, and then he turned, and everything was up against the golf ball. That ball wasn't going left unless he wanted to go left. And, uh, but that's, that's the only thing. <clears throat> and then with a little bit of your right foot, uh, uh, Kumo, the uh, uh, Tiger's new advisor, he's got a, a little bit of a drill. That's a sensation as you come down as you're, you're turning your right foot. The pressure is going uh, clockwise. Right, Mike Maves talks about that. And that it, it, you're 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 uh, moving everything. You're putting pressure that way to the right, clockwise, and that gets you uh, really. And then you're up against the ball. You're to the left side, and then you use your right. Everybody says, "Okay, I, I'm 
I'm, I'm from the left to the right, and then I go to the right. Well, no, it's from the left to the right, then to the left, and then to the right. It's everything is, is being balanced and counterbalanced, just like with your, uh, your karate and stuff. You just don't like that. I mean, right. you're, once you're set, everything's come to the party. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting because my right heel has, has had a tendency to pop up for a long time. Right. And I do think that I need to uh, keep working on that, that weight transition. But I was watching right. a video that I found <clears throat> interesting. Uh, some of the, uh, some of the um, I'm not sure if they were TPI guys, but these, uh, these folks uh, who were um, physiologists were saying that right. You, I'm. I may need to have more flexibility and stretch my Achilles in the back of my my hamstrings. Okay. Because uh, it it may pop up a little bit because there's not enough space and it just yeah. gets pulled off early. So, um, but I will be working on that transition today. Is also uh, allowing the club to fully release. Yeah. Um. And uh. And yeah. So every day's a journey. Thank you so much, Billy hey. Martin. I love your work. You're a gracious man. I'm glad we're friends. And uh, thank you for being my first interview uh, on my swing evolution. Well, this, this has been the cake and the ass. <laughs> it's just the beginning. So uh, our, I'll our, be in touch. Person. And I, I hope that uh, my subscribers like this. Feel free yeah. to comment below if you'd like to see more of these. And I'll try and get better at the technology. Uh, but this is a wonderful way to be able to talk to a friend that's literally about 1,500 miles away. And it's like you're sitting right next to me. Thank you so much. You take care and go out and hit them. Crush. I knock them. Okay, man. We'll see you. Bye. Take care.